and welcome to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. Join us for interviews, updates and chat with artists, influencers and those that manufacture the gear that we love. Hello and welcome to 9 to 42, which is the podcast from the guys at the Guitar Show UK. And Jason is chuckling away because this is my second crack at trying to do the intro, which seems to be the new norm for us. <laughs> uh, evening, Jace. How are you? I'm very good, mate. How are you? Do you know what? I'm really, really well because it's been a lovely day and I've got through quite a lot of stuff and I'm finishing off the day doing this, which is a nice way to, a nice way to finish. I'm, That's I'm, a good start I'm to quite... the weekend, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's a really good start to the weekend. Really good start to the weekend. Uh, we better we better get in and we better introduce our our guest. Uh, our guest is is basically um, in charge of mandolins and uh, what well, mandolins and guitars or the mandolin and guitar division for Eastman Guitars. But I'm not going to tell you his name. And the reason I'm not going to tell you his name is I'm going to let him do it because I've had two goes and I've got it terribly wrong and it's just going to be so offensive so we've agreed i can call him pep so pep will you give us your full name please okay are you are you ready for it we're ready okay but bang at heart and you can see why i didn't have a crack at that can't you <laughs> there you go there's nothing about my yorkshire upbringing that was going to get that right <laughs> at all pep it's lovely lovely to meet you for the first time i know you and jace have known each other for a long while but it's lovely to see you are you well i'm i'm very well especially here on a friday night uh, hanging out it feels a bit I, I told jason it feels a bit like hanging out with your mates at the pub which is unfortunately especially in holland completely uh, a no-go area so so this is this is a nice substitute yeah, and we can do that now. We're 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 back doing that. So well, we can I sit outside I the pub. Yet. We sit outside the pub, the beer um, garden, the beer garden. Yeah. I went to um, Iceland a couple of years ago um, in November and had to buy like a proper outdoor winter coat. Obviously, it's freezing. I mean, I sat outside having a drink with some friends the other day, and I got this coat on, and I was still really cold. <laughs> It's not the right time of year to sit in a beer garden, is it? Let's be no, honest. It's not. So, I mean, I know Jason's got questions lined up, but I am going to have. I'm going to have to deal with the name because we've just been talking about your name, and you told me quite a funny story. So, tell me a little bit more about what you could have been called. Well, yeah, there, there is, there is. I mean, whenever I go abroad, uh, people always struggle with my name because it's a difficult name. It's got all kind of letters that don't or doesn't exist in other languages. Mm. And uh, one of the issues is the A from Pepin. But then I've always managed to tell them that uh, actually I've been quite lucky because I could have been called so many different names as my mother was reading Lord of the Rings uh, when she was pregnant of me. <laughs> and so it could have been Gandalf or, or, or Gollum or any kind of weird name from that book. So in the end, Pepin is not that bad, but it's, it's a, a Gandalf would be easier for all of you guys, uh, especially the English speaking side of the world. Gandalf would have been quite cool, but I think it's fine the way it is. And if you also just just as a little warning, if you hear a slight blip on the audio every once in a while, we've got a slightly uh, a slightly temperamental mic going on tonight, so occasionally he's plugging plugging in, or unplugging and plugging back in again. So you might see it, hear the odd bump. I'll try and take them out when I edit, but if not, uh, apologies for that in advance. Jace, I'm going to let you kick in because I'm going to enjoy this conversation. You know, I, I know very little about this story, so I'm looking forward to. To, to hearing it as we go yeah i mean i i didn't really know eastman but um and i'm not entirely sure how uh, you ended up doing the guitar show oh god three four five years ago something yeah, like that five, five years ago i think I, th I think it was uh, russ who's the uk sort of um yeah. rep for want of a better description had popped into the office and and, and i can remember the first the first show that you did um, and just being blown away, uh, particularly by the sort of like hollow body guitars. Um, and then, we, you know, we kind of, you know, we, we met each other at Nam and stuff like that. And I think we should tell the story at some point this evening <laughs> of the Christmas bar in Nashville <laughs> that we ended up in. But <laughs> but I suppose really, because cause Eastman is, is a relatively new guitar brand. In terms of the guitar world and yeah. history, it's relatively new. Um, so I thought we if we start with the story of Eastman... And then how you kind of slide into that story. Yeah, well, it, it, 
the story of Eastman, and before I tell you that, I have to uh, tell you a little side note, which is so funny that at one time I ended up with uh, Nels Klein of Wilco in a Utrecht bar, and uh, Wilco and Nels is one, both my favorites. So I just oh, I love Wilco. And, no, and, and, and 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 Nels is playing one of our Mendo cellos, and 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 uh, he knew nothing about Eastman. He said, "Can you tell me the story?" I told him the story, and and he wept. I, I have to admit that he, he drank a couple of really strong <laughs> drinks in that bar, but he wept. He, he loved it, and uh, he asked me to tell the story again. So it must be a good story. So, I, so, <laughs> so here I go again. Now, Eastman, Eastman uh, started in 1992, so, so quite a while. My, the, our CEO and founder, Mr. Chen Ni, uh, born in China, um, obviously, communist China was not, especially at that point in time before the 90s, was not that easy to live in. Um, the parents of Chen really wanted him to have a better life. He studied the flute, the classical flute, and he got a scholarship in the U.S. Uh, to study the flute. And what I always say is when he... When he uh, participated and he looked at his fellow students who were playing rather crappy cellos and violins and he asked them why do you play such a crappy instrument or i mean I, i'm telling it in my he, he he will tell you a different story but that's the short version of it and and yeah then he heard the price and he was amazed by the amount of money that they had to pay for that instrument and it wasn't a particularly good one and he mm. knew people in china who were capable of incredible stuff handwork really uh, handcrafted cellos and violins, and together with his fa with his father, they started literally from from scratch, bringing over cellos and violins to the U.S. and in a van driving around the U.S. very very uh, down the the 905 uh, all the way down, and it's a it's a very uh, it's a very yeah, a moving story because literally brick by brick, mile by mile, he he conquered the 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 story. And uh, Eastman is one of the biggest, or perhaps the biggest, uh, handcrafted brand of uh, cellos and violins. And by now, uh, thirty years later, next year we have our thirtieth anniversary. We are, uh, yeah, a company that have uh, all kinds of brass instruments, so saxophones, tubas, uh, all kinds of stringed instruments like the cellos, the double basses, violins, and we we added the guitars in um, from 2004, 2005 on. Uh, so the guitars are the relatively the, the the new kid on the block for Eastman, but the company is 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 for a longer time and it's really it's really a beautiful story because it it really was founded on the whole concept of making making the best possible instrument available for everybody not just mm. the people who have the money who can buy the uh, the high priced quality instruments but just the best possible instrument at a price that any musician can afford and so how did how did you come into that story then yeah, well, thanks to Gibson, we have a big thank you to 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 say to 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 Gibson uh, and and a little bit to Taylor, but especially Gibson, because uh, I was working uh, as a distributor in uh, the Benelux for Gibson and Epiphone, and uh, Gibson by then stopped working with uh, local distributors and they mm. they set up e uh, Gibson Europe, and obviously kicked out the uh, the, the local. Uh, distributor that I was working for. So we were sitting, I think it was 2006 or something, we were sitting in an office with a couple of guys in a, at a round, literally a round table, very frustrated. How do you, in any chance, how do you yeah, replace a, a, a brand like Gibson? That's irreplaceable, such a, such a huge turnover. So uh, I knew of a company in my hometown, also a distributor for Taylor Guitars, and I thought, well, these guys, they want out. They want to uh, go on and their pen, enjoy their pension. So perhaps we can buy that company. And at least we have an A brand then. Mm. And that ended up, and the, the company was called Benelli Import. And they were the distributor for, for Taylor Guitars. And uh, the minute we bought the company, Taylor Guitars went direct. <laughs> started <laughs> Taylor Europe. So so these both these 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 big brands took 
uh, very logical steps, uh, especially this day and age. But they they were they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, and we had to cope with uh, with the rest. And there was yeah yeah we, they start that's Benelli Import. They had a brand Eastman, and it was high quality Chinese made handcrafted acoustic guitars, uh, some some arch tops, some mandolins, and they were not cheap, especially not for Chinese. Uh, mm. Instruments. It was a f- the, the cheapest acoustic guitar was was five hundred euros, so about four hundred pounds, four hundred twenty five pounds. And um, yeah, the first time I played one, I just I couldn't believe it. It was the best possible guitar I've ever played. I really, really was impressed by it. And and from that moment on, I knew that this was going to be my future and the future of the company. And the first day that we bought that company and that I was made director and I was sitting uh, for the first time behind the desk feeling very, very nervous. Uh, am, I, am I up for this job? And the phone rang and, and on the other side it was Chen, our founder and uh, CEO, and, and he wanted to know what kind of guy I was. And we were on the phone for an hour and a half. He called from the US where he was living at that time. And... Uh, yeah, we just hit it off, and he at the end of the the end of the the, the conversation, he said, "Do you want to come and live in the U.S. <laughs> and work with me on on setting up the guitar?" And I was, yeah, this is my first day at the new job. That <laughs> would not be my my. I don't think the family was immediately up for moving up to uh, to the U.S. So we didn't. Uh, we the relationship started as a distributor for just the Benelux, so Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, distributing the Eastman uh, guitars. And that from that point on, it was just going so well. And we were, it, yeah, the brand is so brilliant. And after a while, I said to Chen, I said, "Well, we have to do this ourselves. We have to do." an Eastman Europe and we we set up in 2014 we set up Eastman Europe direct and from that point on everything moved forward to uh, to where we are now at this moment in time that's the short version you've got uh, acoustics mandolins and and so on where do the where do the the thin lines the solid bodies come from was that you oh well we we already had some thin lines the the solid bodies definitely me um yeah, the, the beauty of a company like Eastman and, and the, the, the job that I have and, and the job that I'm doing uh, on a daily basis, I could never have done that at any other company. Because that, as Eastman, it's, it's very non... Uh, uh, how do you say that? That's an, that's a, that's an English word with, uh, uh, where the, there, it's a very flat organization. I, yeah, I try yeah. to, to move my way around the difficult word. So the, the the company is very flat. So anyone who sees an opportunity or a chance can can step up to the plate and and just do that and and do what what needs to be done. And that's what I did. I saw that there was someone missing in between all the different parts because the instruments are made in Beijing, in mm. China, fully by hand. Uh, and of course, in the course of the years, we we have some machinery and we have some CNCs, uh, but the majority of the, the instruments are made by hand. And based on the way the violins were made uh, in the, back in the day of Stradivari, it was literally a team of specialists, everyone doing a specific bit on the instrument. And because they do a specific bit, they are very, very good at that. So yeah. it's literally a, a, an instrument crafted by a team of, of specialists. And that makes the instrument so incredibly good. And and it's 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 time honored. It's the way it has been done in the in the golden age of instruments. So, yeah, we we started with the acoustics, and it was just a, s- a simple line. And after that, we added uh, traditional instruments, the traditional uh, d- d- dreadnoughts, OM stuff like that. Uh, arch tops was what how we started, uh, and mandolins, and because everything that involved carving, which we already learned doing the violins yeah, yeah so whenever it has a carved top that then we're the masters and that that's that's our home turf that's what we are used to do so yeah for me obviously the arch top world is 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 uh slowly getting smaller i mean the 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 you see i the other day i found out that gibson other than two or three very expensive uh, uh custom shop model, models 
they don't build any arch tops anymore. So then I thought, oh, probably they do them at Epiphone. Well, there's just one or two thick body arch tops. And so mm. literally uh, that is a shrinking market and we, we will always do that, but we also have to prepare for the future. So uh, I added the solid bodies and expanded the, 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 the thin line models. So we have a, a much wider range of, of, of guitars. Whenever it's got six strings, as far as the guitars go, uh, yeah, we have it on offer and, and, and in many varieties and, and very traditional. And at the same time, always with that, that, that uh, how do you say that, that basic thing where it always has to be available for everybody, mm-hmm. not just for the people with the, with the, the deeper pockets. <laughs> okay, I'm the, I think the last time I saw you was NAM God 2020. Yeah, so 18, 15 months ago or something. Um, and <laughs> you just you were just launching, I think, it was the new SB55s? Yes. Yes, we did. I've, which, um, and they're kind of, they're, they're the classic junior kind of thing, really, aren't they? You know, I've been having a bit of a look, a, a poke around, and there's some, some absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, models. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I got handed... Uh, I think Russ handed me the single cut um, SB55, and he went play this, and I just looked at him and he went, "Yeah, I know, I got you." <laughs> <laughs> just oh, I don't need another guitar. <laughs> the funny thing is with with every and it yeah, it all sounds like a, like a very cheesy commercial, but the the actual fact is that every guitar that we make is just so incredibly phenomenal special there is something magic going on Uh, we the easy way is also that we say okay we offer a custom shop quality at standard pricing but then you're only referring to pricing and normally i always try try to stay away about pricing because uh, the word affordable etc it's it's always coming into play when when we it's it yeah people speak Mm -hmm. about eastman but the basic essential is that if for instance with the with the SB55, if you if you want to have a one pickup P90 guitar, most of the time that's not going to be your your main guitar or your only guitar because it's it's a fantastic guitar, but yeah, it doesn't yeah. do everything. So then, if you want to buy that that type of guitar uh, and you want a really good one, <laughs> it's extremely expensive so for most people yeah they they dream about a guitar but they would never buy it because yeah on the side it's too much for on the side blah 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 so so i wanted to have a guitar that that was within reach and and that ticked all the boxes and and one of the the most important things that i managed to do at eastman is literally uh, bring the violins into the guitars by uh, adding the the violin varnish Every violin mm. is finished uh, not by spraying it, but by by hand rubbing, French polishing the finish on the guitar or on the violin. And what the difference is so big with a sprayed guitar because the the, the, the French polish is, I think, the thinnest finish you can apply on any instrument. And why do they do it on violins? Because it's the best finish the mm. best sounding finish you can find in the world. And the downside is it, it doesn't give any protection. Mm. So with a violin, it's not a problem. If you look at any violin, a 200 years old violin, a five year old violin, there's no lacquer on the neck because that's the only part where the, the body touches the instrument. With a guitar, you touch it everywhere. It's literally mm. your your body, your, your gut, your hands, your arms, everything's touched. So that was probably the reason why people also in the older days didn't use that finish because it got beaten up very, very easy. So I, I, um, I invented the antique varnish, which is, again, I just stole it from our violin department because every violin looks as if it's 200 years old. So I just literally yeah. said to our specialist, Mrs. Hua Rong, who is a wonderful lady and absolute master in her profession and i said i want a guitar that 
looks like that violin and she immediately backs off and oh no 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 I don't know nothing about that <laughs> and I said well it's easy so they gave me we call that a white guitar it's just just a body without any frets or anything unfinished and I had to pretend playing it without strings etc so I was just being yeah uh, giving her a Keith Richard concert you know <laughs> m- mucking about with the guitar uh, doing all the moves that come when you play guitar and she was marking it with her pencil everywhere I hit the guitar and in the end that was the first instrument that typical Jason instrument was the T58 a, a kind of Gretschy big arch top with a big Bixby on it and yeah, that finish is really proprietary Eastman. It's a unique finish. And the reason why we age that finish already is not because we want to be hip or we want to do what's commercially the most valid thing to do and people want that. But it's really, if you hang it new on the wall in a shop, first one playing it marks it. Yeah. So so it was the sensible thing to do. And we get so many requests from people. Yeah, I, I like that guitar, but can you can you not already antique it not age it and I, I always have to say i'm very sorry we can't do that because otherwise you'd be disappointed and once it's already marked the first mark is lots of like a new car mm. once it has its first dent you don't care anymore <laughs> but the first one is really hard well we already dent it so that problem is taken out of the equation i love how much you love you, you genuinely love eastman i, I we were at um nashville and um you'd got that um you have to forgive me i can't remember the model is was it the four eight six was it that was the black over red with the big yeah Bixby? yeah 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 the, the, T, was, the it, t59 the t i tried to give them always years so t59 t58 sb55 just referring it, to a specific time and it was it was kind of like i think it was modeled on little barry's guitar I, I i think i mean it was it was just such a, a a fabulous guitar and um chris vinicum had been on the uh the booth just before me and he'd set up the amp and the pedal board and everything so everything just sounded absolutely perfect and i'm playing away on this guitar and then i was telling Ant you did that uh that classic salesman trick and i was going, i was going this is amazing i love this guitar this is fantastic and you went do me a favor i'm like yeah yeah what what just go over to the big G over there and play their equivalent and then come back. I was like, oh, okay. So I went over and I, you know, potted around the Gibson stand for a bit and, and played several 335s and 345s or whatever. And then I came back and I was like, yeah. And you were like, I know, I know. It's so much better, isn't it? And it's like, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Well, and I, 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 mean, I never, I mean, because they, they laid the foundations, uh, the Big G company, and they are, especially the last few years, they've they done an incredible job in, in, in reinventing themselves and getting back mm. in the saddle uh, quality-wise, instrument-wise. So the new leadership is doing amazing things. But the beauty with the varnish, and that was what I was referring to, that the varnish makes that instrument not only look like it's old but it feels it feels it feels feels old old. and it gives immediate instead of having to play that guitar and getting to used to it and you got it a couple of months or years and then it starts opening up it immediately everything's there it's just as if it's your best friend that you've always had along with it with you and that's that's where we always win when when people start playing a guitar of ours and I have to say, I mean, that's the difficulty with a podcast. I, I, I talk too much. You give me a mic, <laughs> I'll, I won't shut up. So just please stop me. That is the beauty of a podcast. That's what we want you for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, all these, these fantastic people that I came across over the years, I mean, starting in China. And one of the things, when I'm, when, no, I've, I haven't been in the workshop for a year and a half because if, if I go to China now, I, first I have to spend two weeks in a horrible hotel mm-hmm. in quarantine. So we wait until that measure is dropped and then I can go back. But if I walk around, it's literally you don't hear any noise. You only hear this, the scratching and, and of all kinds of, of, of manual work, manual labor. And whenever... I, I, I thank people. I say, oh, well, wonderful. Thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. And then, then they say, oh, thank you. I will try to do better tomorrow. <laughs> and I, 
that is such a such a wonderful way of of to to do your job and one of the things that people always ask you are the chinese and they're, they're sweatshops and it's like uh, people are treated badly and then they are not they are treated extremely well they are paid well they are their own boss so the person who's who's doing the the fret work he gets paid by the amount of, of work he does on a, on, on a daily basis and he decides whether and when his wife is sick or he has to stay with the kids or whatever he just works less and and if he wants to stay longer and make an extra buck he stays longer it's up to him and the whole workshop is arranged that way there are many many families working in our workshops and i never say factory because it's not a factory because it's 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 a workshop it's like like you walk back into the 50s or the 40s and all these people there, their wives, husbands, fathers, aunts, they're all working there. Lots of women in China are in charge. Most of the production managers are women, at least the good ones, because the ones that are not as good are often the males and get replaced by the females who are, for some reason, just better organized, more strict, and the whole production process is just so much more fluent. But it's, a, again, a very emancipated uh, society, the Chinese society. So that's so interesting to learn and to see and to be part of. Cool. So um, there's the new model as well. Is this one that you've designed yourself, the Romeo? Is, is... No, no, I, I cannot take any credit because my, my, I have, I, have a, uh, I always say, my better half, Mr. Otto D'Ambrosio. He is a he is a real full blown designer. He uh, he started working as an apprentice with John Monteleone. John Monteleone is one of the most renowned currently living arch top builders in New York City. Uh, Otto has been his apprentice, um, and he has his own. He had his own company and designed his own arch top guitars, and then um, I think. 2008 2009 Otto came to to fully work with us uh, and he's a real designer but we are like yin and yang we the one can't go without the other I'm not a a designer in the way that that I can can come up with a completely new design but I know what I want to see and Otto is capable of really doing something from scratch and mm. that's that's where we currently are working we try to find our own way our own voice our own look our own signature in the, in, in in the electric solid body guitars and uh, that's that's a, a, it's a very gratifying yeah path to follow because we were talking about the sb55 well i knew when we did that guitar that it was going to be a monster hit because mm. it has proven itself i really we never by the way we never copy it's always a shape that that this shape i did uh but it's always different of course it's reminiscent because it's the most conservative uh the most conservative market in the world imagine that we were all still driving those cool cars from the 50s but well, we're not for, awesome. for, yeah for some reason i don't know why why don't they do that i mean i don't if you, know i went to, i went to cuba a couple of years ago family holiday and it was just the most amazing thing. And I, mean, I know they keep them going on like chewing gum and bits of string and stuff like that. But genuinely, oh, I'd love a car that was like 50 foot long with fins on it and everything. They just look amazing. I don't know, I don't know at what point society went, no, we don't want that cool looking stuff. But I, just, what, what is that? There is, I think it has to do with safety. Have you got any idea, Ant? Why? Yes, it's got to do with the fact that at some point you've got to park it in an Aldi car park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's definitely true. Well, the, 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 the thing with, with, with the guitars is that still the guitars that were built in the 50s are still the best sold guitars in the world. It's the Stratocaster, the Telecaster, the Gibson Les Paul, the ES-335. So that is, that is very, very hard to come up with something that is... Yeah, better or or equal or earns mm. its place next to these gigantic, unique designs. So what what we did in the past was was trying to to add something to the original design that takes away the problems that original designs have. Mm. And because when these guitars were invented or designed, 
yeah, there were hardly was any pop music. I mean, when when a three three five or a, or a, a casino or an ES three three thirty was was designed, there were no Beatles to play it. No. So so how how would they know they were aiming it at the jazz market? So the whole concept was so different. Mm. And and for instance, with the uh, 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 the SB fifty five, there is the rap over bridge. And that on the Les Paul Jr. you have the rap over bridge and it's never in tune on the 12th fret and the intonation is a problem. So, yeah, that was the first thing that I had to look at because if you mm. do something like that, it has to be an improvement or you have to add something, bring something to the table what's not already there. And uh, one of the things that, that, that I found uh, Faber, uh, Germany, a German company where Gottfried makes the most amazing uh, parts, an aluminium wrap over bridge with compensated uh, parts, which makes this instrument suddenly in tune on the 12th fret. And, and, and that's a wonderful thing. And then small things like, like locking studs. It sounds horrible. It sounds like a, like a, a hair metal guitar with, with <laughs> trying to make dive bombs. But locking studs is very simple. You have that tailpiece... And it has to connect to the stud that goes into the body. Mm. And because of the pull of the string, the, the tailpiece is, is more or less uh, 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 pulled loose from the stud. But by just adding a simple ring, the stud keeps the, the tailpiece in its place. And, and that gives better sound, better sustain. Everything on the guitar gets better on that simple in, in invention. So those are, for instance, two things that were really contributing to being yeah, a better guitar than the original design. And I'm not saying mm. that, that a, a 1955 Gibson Les Paul Jr., I mean, those, yeah, these are amazing guitars. But I studied between 20 and 30 original pieces, and some were stellar and others were horrible. Because the, the, the quality was also... I mean, they didn't know back then. There was no production. They didn't know how to make guitars in larger quantities, etc., etc. That's one mm. of the things that we do so much better now. Not we as Eastman, but we as a guitar industry. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely more consistent. Sorry, Ant, carry well, on. Well, I was just about to say, I think the other thing back to then is nobody in 1950-whatever was expecting that in 2021 we would be talking about those guitars. I mean, in reality, the, you know, no, nobody thought, oh, let's build something that's got a 75-year lifespan. But that's that, the thing. I mean, if you see the, the, the interviews with the Beatles in the 60s and how much longer do you think you'll be doing that? <laughs> well, we could do another year or so, but after that, we, you know, we probably go do something else, a real job. <laughs> it's so funny. It is, it is kind of unique, actually, that... I, and I don't know whether it is something to do with the, the point in time that those designs came about and the fact that they went through two or three genres of music very, very quickly, that suddenly those instruments weren't defined by a genre. So, you know, uh, whereas a, if you if you let's let's take the, the pointy headstock thing uh, of, of the sort of the mid eight, the mid 80s or the, the, through the 80s, that became very associated with a particular genre. And to a certain extent, that has stuck. You know that that genre has then stuck with that that instrument. And yes, there are, there are a few people who've played Ibanez that haven't played in that particular style, as an example. But there aren't very many. And I think I think whereas I think if we talk about the original designs, they were never they somehow never got tagged with a genre. So they've 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 effectively, you know, it's been easy to reinvent. And easy for for a guitar to be something that that sits as comfortably in punk. As it does in country and western, if you take something like yeah. a Telecaster, yeah, no, it's it's it that is that is the beauty of, of 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 guitars that they they serve so many so many masters and and it's and it's it's whatever I mean if you go check out uh, Jason's band or you you you, <laughs> you check out my music it's very different but mm. I bet we we use a lot of the same guitars or the same amps and the same pedals. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm, actually, I don't think our music is that different i'm just a bit more rock than you but i think that we we share a love uh, and ant does as well as like americana and oh, stuff and like, like wilco and ryan adams and stuff like that i'm just not very good at playing like that i can listen to it as much <laughs> as i like but when i strap it on uh, you suddenly realize that the guitar's by my knees and i like it loud and distorted yeah. no and it's that's 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 a very good thing 
But the, <laughs> with with guitars, if you and that's that's what I I love about Otto and his designing because, for instance, the Romeo model was our first original thin line instrument that we uh, that legendary mm. Nashville guitar show in 2019 where Jason was and I was uh, we introduced that guitar and that guitar was the first real original design from scratch doesn't look like anything else mm. and it's a fully hollow thin line very small with a shorter scale and it's got a, 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 a again that that hand carved solid spruce top that we, that we are used to from the violins and the uh, and the arch tops, uh, two Lola humbuckers, which normally if you have those humbuckers on a guitar like that, you have feedback and problems, and you don't. And for some reason, the workshop made a mistake, adding on the prototype a a maple neck instead of a mahogany neck that was supposed to have. And suddenly there was something like magic happening because this guitar had two humbuckers, was a hollow body, was perhaps intended to be kind of jazzy, but it turned out you could play every John Mayer album, every song on every John Mayer album, especially with your fingers, because there was like a stretty and a telecaster kind of sound from a completely different looking guitar. So that guitar took the world by storm. And, and, and in 2020, that was our number one sold electric guitar which is so satisfying because it's original. It doesn't look like anything else. Yeah. And it really, and, and, and that's, the whole thing was fully auto. He, he did that all by himself. And, and, and um, from that on, we, this year we, we, uh, we launched Romeo L.A., and it, it lit. I'm looking at it now in Celestine, Celestine Blue. Celestine Blue. Celestine, and yeah, it looks superb. Celestine. And that is that guitar is 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 it's it's going to come to the shops this May the first first limited models coming out, and and that's when the the beauty between Otto and myself because so Otto has this design and then I start thinking yeah but I also want to have a certain people I'd like to have a kind of surfy guitar you know mm-hmm. so we put in P90s from Seymour Duncan with radiator covers. And I reached out to my good friend Dieter Goldsdorfer, the uh, the CEO and founder of Duesenberg, because we w- I wanted a Bixby, like like Jason, uh, like was... like Chris. We are crazy about Bixbys. We we love yeah. Bixby, but the Bixby we couldn't get the Bixby to to go on the Romeo. The top was too carved and it was too small on the on the backside, so it mm. didn't fit. And it was such a huge disappointment because this guitar was screaming for a, for a tremolo. How could we solve it? So I, I called Dieter Goldsdorf and I said, well, and he's like a mad scientist. He invents stuff that nobody else uh, invents with his Duesenberg brand. And he also has a brand Goldo that makes all kinds of parts. And I said, I need, I need a trem, a kind of jazz mastery trem for that guitar. And he had the less trem, it's called. And you, you mm. can aftermarket click it on any stop tail guitar you don't have to drill you don't have to do anything and suddenly you have a jazz master in your hands or a kind of jazz mastery sound so the whole hollow body that color that that Otto came up with everything contributes to a unique instrument that really when you play it immediately you are surfing the waves in LA <laughs> I've surfed the waves in LA and I, I have to say it's the most knackered I've ever been <laughs> in my entire life <laughs> I booked a booked a forty five minute surfing lesson on Santa Monica Beach, and and uh, me and my family were taught by Todd and Clay, which were about <laughs> as American as you could possibly get, and they were going snap up, dude, snap <laughs> up. I'm like, I'm nearly fifty. I'm not snapping up anywhere. <laughs> was Troy not available that day? <laughs> oh man, it was just ah. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been surfing, but it is the most exhausting thing in the world. It, it, it's all right being thrown back in by the waves, but it, then it's having to swim out back past them whilst you're carrying something that feels like it weighs about 10 stone. It makes no sense to me. It's it's the equivalent of going skiing without a ski lift. It's like you yeah. can, you can come down, but you've got to walk up to the top of the mountain with your skis first. No. Yeah. Why, why would you do that? Why would well, you I, do that? I always wonder, did nobody ever watch Jaws? <laughs> because 
because well i had a family trip in the u.s as well just like what jason was saying and we were in the water and we were in in in, in santa cruz and we were in the water rather deep big waves and we were having fun me and my two sons and there were surfers around us and the server said oh, i was better not to be here uh, if you're not on a surfboard because of the sharks it was literally shark week Discovery <laughs> Channel was was filming Shark Week in Santa Cruz, and we were in the water, and all these guys, and I was, and they were pedaling, and they were keeping their their feet up on on their boards. But if I mean anywhere where there's big waves, there's sharks. To be honest, I fell off so many times it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> <ever again. laughs> you were going to drown first. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 sharks weren't going to get me. <laughs> Were you were you in your in your speedos or did you have a... no? I was, <laughs> no so, so they give you a wetsuit. You, you, you hire a wetsuit, um, and the guy looked at me and he went, "Yeah, okay," and just handed me a wetsuit. I've never put a wetsuit on before in my life, so I'm in a car park, you know, um, just by the beach, and I'm struggling into this wetsuit, and I'm like, I re- and I like, I know they're supposed to be tight, right? <laughs> and then. Then I get I get about half on and I'm trying to get my arm, you know, so you've got your legs in and you're trying to get your arms in. And he went, oh, I've given you the wrong size, <laughs> size dude. <laughs> of course, when he gave me the right size, it fitted really quickly. <laughs> but I spent like 15 minutes rolling around on the floor trying to pull this thing on. So, so Pep, what's next? What's next? You've got, you've got. You've got um, it was the Romeo, wasn't it? That's that's launching the uh, the Romeo LA is launching or, or arriving, not launching, arriving. You said you said in May. Yeah, that's um, that's arriving in May, and and uh, for next year we are planning to to launch our first original uh, solid body guitar, and uh, that is nerve wracking because the solid body market. I mean, with thin lines you get away. With yeah. a little originality. I don't know, though. I, I think it's been quite interesting looking at the guitar market, probably over the last decade, that you've now got stuff like um, Revelator and Fano and all of that sort of stuff, which is is very different. I mean, you can see its heritage, but they are completely new designs, and they they do appear to be quite successful relatively speaking not obviously fender gibson no no successful. they are they are and dennis fano is, is is one of the the big innovators in in the in the solid body uh, guitar market and um i i don't i never knew what what happened because he he had this brand fano which is obviously mm. his last name but then another company bought that company and he's not allowed to to design fano guitars so now he's yeah. he's he's novo guitars also Really, really impressive. I mean, this guy, mm. yeah, he he set a new standard and 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 definitely an inspiration when it comes to finding uh, new ways. So so what we one of the things that we always got asked is, well, when are you going to do an SG? No, we're not going to do an SG. Gibson does an SG, and if there is one shape, I feel that that literally you can you can n- do nothing to but ruin it is an SG. An SG is perfect. The two yeah. horns, only a madman would come up with a guitar like that. And it, <laughs> you know the story that Les Paul, it, it, it was supposed to be the follow-up on the Les Paul. And Les Paul yeah. himself hated the look of it. So he, he demanded from Gibson to take off the plate that says Les Paul model because he didn't want to be affiliated with it. I think it's it's a brilliant design. So any company, I think ESP does a nice one with the Viper that that comes yeah. that's a little It's got a slightly offset yeah, exactly. at the bottom. But other than that the rest is just horrible. They look like 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 leprechauns or or or, or yeah, misformed midgets. It's like <laughs> weird. There's nothing good you can do if you want to pay tribute to a model like that. But the sound of a slab of mahogany with mm. two humbuckers, very simple, or two P90s, that is pure magic. So that's something that we did not have. And that's what Otto and me have been designing since uh, January 2020. Um, it's a little offset. It's got a... And it, nobody knows about this. So this is, this is a real premiere. 
only on this podcast. For the podcast, Dan. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. So it's got a. Uh, I incorporated a couple of things that I thought, yeah, are just really, really. I mean, everybody loves a firebird. Don't you love a firebird? The raised middle part. Well, see, I've got a non-reverse firebird rather than a reverse firebird. I love the non-reverse one. Well, I I love the reversed one, but if you if you strap it on, it immediately smacks you in the face. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it it I mean the balance. There's no balance. It's too heavy and it plays really hard. The non-reverse is much more playable and a wonderful guitar. But I love that raised middle part, and so mm. so we've added the raised middle part to a to an okume body, and okume is a, an African uh, wood that is always very light. And very close to mahogany, but not as uh, mahogany can be very, very heavy, very light. Depending on you, never know what you're gonna get. And, yeah. and we want guitars always to be very, very comfortable, very lightweight, and very resonant. So it's an Okume body with that raised middle part offset. Again, a knot to the Firebird, and 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 uh, we designed our first six on a six on a row headstock so it's the first headstock from Eastman that has I will show you afterwards on camera yeah, nobody yeah. can see it but I'm not allowed to show it but it's behind me and we're working with uh, the UK guys from Bare Knuckle on the pickups specific mm. pickups that we want in there um, so but it's it's literally was planned to be launched uh, this January but because of the lockdowns and the travel, uh, travel uh, you, you, you can't do something. So it takes so much longer to finish a product, a, a, a prototype. Yeah. So yesterday, or no, Wednesday, I received my first finished prototype that was actually playable at pickups and could listen to sounds. And so that's uh, it went from Otto made it in, his, in the workshop in Pomona, Los Angeles, where our American headquarters is. Then he shipped... The, 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 the naked bodies shipped them to China to have them finished. To, to, we did mm. tests on the colors. Uh, we had an antique varnish one and two nitrocellulose gloss ones. Then they shipped them back to Otto. And Otto started working on installing the parts. Uh, we have this, again, there are so many great companies in the UK, like, like Bare Knuckle, but also Rothko and Frost. I don't know if you are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, these guys, they have pig guard material that is just, there's just no end to the enormous fantasticness of that. So beautiful material that, that uh, there's a lot of things about this guitar that, that is really special. And it's not looking like anything there's already th out there. So that's going to, be, uh, going to be costing me a couple of nights of sleep. So Jason, next year, <laughs> in January, when we are in L.A., before the show starts, better take me to 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 a bar and and, and get me drunk. Otherwise, I won't sleep for a week. Oh yeah, well, I, I, we need to tell the story of when we went to a bar and got drunk in Nashville. We'd been out for a, a really, really nice, <laughs> grown-up, quiet yeah. meal, intelligent in, in in some sort of like far part of Nashville, and it was it was like a it was a lovely kind of like um, hipster kind of bar restaurant wasn't it yeah, you know it's like an old factory yeah lovely absolutely lovely and and then some lunatic says there's a bar that's called the christmas bar where it's christmas 365 days a year in nashville i would say at this point it's about 120 <laughs> degrees outside you can't walk outside without melting and so we we all jump in a cab so the there's there's us two there's uh, and there's a couple of guys from Guitar Magazine there's Chris and Joe isn't there and I think there yeah, might Sam, be someone else Sam Roberts and Sam uh, lanky Sam um, and uh, we we end up at, and it's like this shack that's in a car park on the <laughs> outskirts of town and we all get out of the cab and we're like um, and it's got snowmen painted on the outside of the building or something Christmas lights walk, everywhere <laughs> yeah we walk in. So this is July. <laughs> we walk in, and it's absolutely rammed. They've got no, no, no laws about smoking indoors no. or anything in this bar. They just didn't care, no. and and they've got a karaoke machine, and the beer's like about two dollars a bottle. Um, I mean, it was just the most insane evening, and then it got even more insane when I turned around, 
and Pep was in the middle of the dance floor singing, I think it was Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye, <laughs> yeah. What's going on? I've always <laughs> dreamt of singing uh, What's Going On and, and, and I had to take the stage and, 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 and I think you or Chris filmed it. Uh, Chris, yeah. yeah, Chris filmed it, and and it, it was it was wonderful, and that was there was a there was a kind of a a male Aretha Franklin. <laughs> Do you remember him? I don't know. Yes. I don't remember. He was he was he was male, but he was Aretha Franklin, and he sang like Aretha Franklin. He sang with me, so it was it was like a. <laughs> Like almost like a like a yeah. How do you say that? It was a an, an angelical experience. Is that? <laughs> it, was, it was utterly insane. I had a brilliant night that had started so grown up and responsible, <laughs> and ended up with us basically face down in a bar yeah. on the outskirts of yeah. town. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what happens when you're in Nashville. <laughs> yeah, I I just I was so gutted that I couldn't go uh, last year and not this year either. But um, it's definitely on my list. I mean, I actually managed to pick up quite a bit of business for the guitar show as well. So it is a justifiable business trip. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing <laughs> with you, Jace. <laughs> and um, yeah, and there's Carter Vintage and there's Grooms and there's uh, Rumble Seat and all those amazing stores to go to. Well, rum, rum, Just... Rumble Seat, it, that's, that's, that's an experience on itself, right? I mean, if you walk yeah. in, the way the guitars are displayed... They have all these tiny, tiny additional things from that certain era of that guitar—a picture, a, a, a magazine. A th- oh, mm. it's just literally—you just walked into heaven, which is not what you experience when you go into Carter Vintage, do you? Um, I re no Carter wasn't like that, but I really like Carter. Actually, of the three that we went to that day, Carter was my favorite. I think because. They got so many, so many guitars, and they were just all over the yeah, place. Yeah, Just pick them yeah. up and play that's them. That's true. And Chris was doing an interview with, um, I don't know, Mr. Carter, whoever. Um, so there was me and there was Joe from Guitar Magazine, and we were just waiting for Chris to do the filming and, you know, the interview sort of stuff. So we were just kicking around in Carter. And, um, and they've got benches as well, so you can just sit down and pick up any guitar and play. And I... I, I swear to God, if I'd have known any way of getting it back, because it was right in the middle of the CITES thing as well, so there was no chance of getting anything with Rosewood out of the States and back to the UK. And they got a, I think it was a 53 or a 54 J45. And, and me and Joe just kept passing it between each other, going, this is the greatest acoustic guitar I've ever played. And and when I say it was affordable, it I mean, it was really expensive, but it was only... I think it was it was three thousand eight hundred dollars, which you know when you convert that back was about three grand or whatever. That's very cheap, and, and f- really cheap for a you know fifties J forty five. But it's the, the finest. That's one of the things that is so great about the US when it comes to guitars that you simply there are so many acoustic <clears throat> guitars made in in in, mm. in the last sixty years, eighty years, so many, and they're all around. So yeah. The exported numbers are much lower. So in the UK or on the European mainland, it's very, very hard to to get any chance to find something. We we were talking when we were out for that dinner. I just remembered, actually, um, about the acoustic guitar brand that you were going yeah. to go into yeah. partnership with. It was Bourgeois. Bourgeois. Yeah. Chris Chris guessed it right back then. Yeah, because I, I guessed Santa Cruz and yeah. Chris guess Bourgeois yeah. and it was kind of like yeah, it was one or the other wasn't it so how's that going oh that is a match made in heaven imagine that, that that's that's a, I don't know how much time we have but that's a that's a great story because I was in Nashville the week before the show visiting some of our Eastman dealers and I got a call from from our American pre- not the American president but the American Eastman president Saul and he said well yeah Chen Chen uh, has 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 more or less fell in love with an acoustic guitar brand, with Bourgeois. He met with Dana Bourgeois and he fell in love with the guitars and he's just, he wants them to join the Eastman family. How do you feel about that? I was psyched about that, of course, but normally when stuff like this happens, it takes like forever. But this was just done between two gentlemen who really understood, these two visionaries who immediately understood what they could offer each other. And uh, so they joined the Eastman family, and, and 
Eastman is 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 known has a history of of uh, going to an American brand, like for instance the the, the flute that Chen was playing in his mm. uh, uh, study years is a Haynes flute. Haynes was the Rolls Royce of classical flutes, and they really suffered uh, economically by the beginning of two thousands. And then they joined the Eastman family, and 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 now it's the number one flute across the world and in all the orchestras. So he has a a really feel for that. And and bourgeois obviously wasn't economically uh, uh, suffering or anything. But the, every every small boutique acoustic guitar builder or electric guitar builder, it's so hard to make any money. Because it's mm. so expensive when you make the best possible instruments with the best possible people in the U.S. And you want to still keep those guitars, yeah, not affordable, but at a certain price. It's impossible to make any money or to grow. That's the mm. hardest thing. So so I think it, for them it's great that they joined us. And for us it's been masterful to learn to to uh i just did a did a piece on reverb with the legendary uh tony bacon he wrote a beautiful oh, piece yeah, yeah. about the, the future of uh of woods and and, and he, i was very very honored to be invited to that panel of uh, of industry people talking about that and i included dana because there's nobody in the world that knows more about woods for guitars than dana he's like literally an encyclopedia so we're working on on instruments that we uh, that partly are built in Lewiston, Maine. They have their own, of course. They build their instruments there, but then mm. we're trying to build a guitar in 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 in, in, in that's that's in the the Martin D twenty eight price range, which is impossible to build for for bourgeois, but partly made in Lewiston, made partly made in our. Uh, workshop in uh, in Beijing, and then that is going to be a really, really, really big worry for the big names because this guitar is 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 going to rule the world. It's it's a series that's called the Touchtone series, and it's amazing, amazing guitar. So very happy to have met these people. They are, I mean, Maine is beautiful. I, I still haven't been able to go there because of the, the pandemic, but. Go check the website. If you if you go to the website now, www.bourgeoisguitars.com, the opening shot it tells you all about what this what this state is about and what this brand is about. It's really really beautiful, and it's yeah, it's it's the kind of place where you know they make beautiful guitars. Blimey! Yeah, yeah, it's stunning. That's stunning, and it's it's amazing guitars, and and the beauty is that. We learn from each other because the way we build acoustic guitars, we have our our main builder and 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 head of the uh, uh, the whole production process and and building all the guitars is a, a man called Koa. Uh, he is he is like a real real master, and everything he touches turns into gold. He is the the reason why all our instruments sound so good. And to ha- to connect him with Dana Bourgeois, who has that same in the high end boutique acoustic world, it's it's worlds of knowledge that that mm. collide together, and 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 only good things come from that. We probably ought to to, to wrap this up in terms of time. So should we should we um, should we just say thank you very much, Pep, for your time? It's been fantastic, absolutely fascinating. I've, I've listened to most of it and. Uh, not really, uh, you know, contributes a great deal, but it's a fascinating story and, and wonderful insights. And I've also been drooling over guitars while we've been talking. So thank you, thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to meeting you as and when we can. Um, yes, please, J- Jace. We ought to we ought to make sure we don't forget to uh, to say thanks again to our our friends at Focusrite. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is recorded on the two i two. Um, and the guys at Focus Right are brilliant, and thank you for their support. You know, yeah, they are absolutely fab, and they keep continuing to support the podcast, which is great because it allows us to crack on. Um, so we're going to disappear, um, so we can look at this prototype that you're not allowed to see. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me. You, you have to to verbally uh, describe what you're seeing. Right. Okay. 
<laughs> oh, oh, loving the head start. Right, I need to. Uh, I need to go to gallery view so I've got a a better view of it. Oh, that's nice. That's nice actually. That the is of the raised middle part. Yeah. Yes. I like um, it. I like a Bigsby. Yeah. Belly cut. Yeah. Beautiful. Is that taut guard as well? Yeah. That's the, the, the guard that I was... And, and the beauty is, yeah, it's hard to show you, but the beauty is that it's it's laid in into the body. Yes, so, I can see yeah. that. So we created a cavity, so it's 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 lower than, than the actual body. That's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. And what's more, I can... This is going to sound crazy. That's a guitar I can see slung around the necks of people on stages, if that makes sense. That's exactly where we want it to be. I can already see it. I just, when I put on, put off my headphones, I realized that the speakers have been on. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Uh. No, no podcast. So, so you you have some some editing <laughs> challenges ahead of you. Oh, just, thanks for that, Pep. <laughs> I didn't know because it was in the headphones. In the headphones. Yeah, in the headphones. I didn't hear it. Right. Well, on on the back of the fact I've now got some editing to do, <laughs> I better I better grab as much time as I possibly can. Uh, Pep, we'll see you really soon. I'm really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you very very much. I think it will be okay. It was not that loud. <laughs> It'll be fine. We'll work it through. <laughs> Gentlemen, stay safe and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. If you've enjoyed the show, then please remember to hit the subscribe button and share with other like-minded souls. For more information about 9 to 42, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at the Guitar Show UK. This has been an A Short Stories production. Mm-hmm.